On the 21st of August, 1945, at the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, physicist Harry Doglian Jr. was performing a rather complex experiment, one that involved a subject named Rufus. Rufus was not large nor threatening in appearance. However, Rufus was known to be incredibly dangerous. In fact, another scientist at the lab compared experiments with Rufus to tickling the tail of a sleeping dragon. What made Rufus special was that Rufus radiated a powerful and unique kind of energy. Scientists were keen to study this energy, the idea being that perhaps the energy could one day be harnessed, maybe even weaponized for war. Rufus would remain asleep for the duration of the experiments. The experiments involved surrounding Rufus with a wall of neutron-reflecting tungsten carbide bricks. Depending on the arrangement, Rufus would either increase or decrease in energy. The idea was to find the perfect level without going too far. With the wrong configuration, Rufus might wake up and release too much energy. And you don't want to wake the dragon now, do you? Harry's initial experiments on that ill-fated day were a success. That night, however, his curiosity got the best of him. He returned to Rufus for another round of tests. Brick by brick, Harry built his wall of tungsten carbide, but then one of the bricks slipped. Harry replaced it as swiftly as possible, but the mistake had already been made. The missing brick created a configuration that Harry would soon lament. There was a sudden flash of blue light. The energy within Rufus was released, and Harry Doglian received a direct hit. 25 days later from that moment, he would be dead. Harry Doglian had woke the dragon. Dragons, perhaps the most well-known of all sci-fi fantasy creatures. They feature into the oldest myths, to the newest movies, television shows, and novels. They can be found in almost every culture spanning the globe. Africa, Asia, Europe, the Americas. Wherever you look, there be dragons. They come in all manner of shapes and sizes with no definitive disposition. There's the Chinese long dragon, the European six-limbed drake, and their wyvern and even great feathered serpents like the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, a personal favorite. They can be heroic, villainous, indifferent, or something in between. Despite their popularity, when George R. R. Martin first envisioned A Song of Ice and Fire, he didn't intend to include them. The Targaryens were originally going to be pyromancers, not dragon riders. It took encouragement from fellow fantasy author Phyllis Einstein to convince Martin to put the legendary fire-breathing beast into his story. Martin has described his dragons as being like nuclear deterrents. In 2011, he said, quote, Dragons are the nuclear deterrent, but is that sufficient? These are the kind of issues I'm trying to explore. The United States right now has the ability to destroy the world with our nuclear arsenal, but that doesn't mean we can achieve specific geopolitical goals. You can have the power to destroy, but it doesn't give you the power to reform or improve or build. End quote. A Song of Ice and Fire is well known for its anti-war themes. So it should come as no surprise, the monstrous mounts in this story aren't just pretty pets for pretty people to ride. They can be wild animals, unpredictable and dangerous if disturbed, but they can be also used as weapons of mass destruction. Dragons can be devastating in battle, incredibly hard to defend against, even more difficult to kill. Their presence in a fight can almost guarantee a victory for those using them. But are they exactly like nuclear weapons? Dragons do not operate as nuclear weapons do. They are living, breathing creatures, not mechanical objects, of course. Their bodies radiate heat, not radiation. 
Some compare dragons to military aircrafts instead. Both aircrafts and dragons can have pilots. They can be used for transport, for scouting, or for attacking. In that case, dragon fire can be viewed like napalm. Because not even a dragon the size of Valerian the Black Dread can do as much damage as one small atomic bomb. However, the nuclear weapon comparison is not entirely without merit. Dragons are a rare power. Across the known world, only the Valerians had dragons. They became even rarer after the Doom, when only a handful could be found on Dragonstone or in King's Landing. It is also a unique power, unlike anything else on Earth. Like nuclear weapons, there are no weapons in this story that can compare. Wildfire burns, but it cannot be controlled, it cannot fly, and it has no intelligence of its own, the ability to separate friend from foe. If you believe in the theory that dragons are genetically modified organisms, then dragons are the result of a secret program like the Manhattan Project. Call it the Valerian Project. There are currently nine countries that can be classified as nuclear powers. While there are over 13,000 nuclear weapons in the stockpile, 90% of those belong to two countries, the United States and Russia. Many countries in the world have an air force. Not every country has nuclear weapons. It's a rare, closely guarded power. The same as dragon power. And now, to speak of the moments in the story where dragons were used as nuclear weapons. When dragons were used to demoralize, to devastate, and to destroy. It is unknown where dragons originated. Some maesters theorize that the Valerians created them by breeding fireworms with wyverns. Fireworms breathe fire, but cannot fly. Wyverns fly, but cannot breathe fire. Combine the two, and you have an incredibly effective aerial weapon when no other nation has aerial power. This wouldn't be the first series where dragons were created for war. I know little of Tolkien, but what I do know is that in his work, which includes The Lord of the Rings, dragons were created for war. The first dragon was bred by Morgoth, the enemy, and his citadel of Angbad. It was called Glaurung, a monstrous worm that walked on four legs and had no wings, so it could not fly. It could breathe fire, however. Glaurung was the first but not the last of Morgoth's dragons. The greatest dragon was Enkalagon the Black. Enkalagon was massive, closer in size to a kaiju than any dragon from A Song of Ice and Fire. He was one of Morgoth's greatest assets. In death, he fell from the sky and his body broke the towers of great mountains. The Dragon Riders of Pern series takes place on the distant planet of Pern. Scientists manipulated the genetic code of a species of reptile native to the planet called fire lizards to create dragons. Fire lizards are quite small. The dragons of Pern are much larger, able to be ridden. To breathe fire, they chew a mineral called firestone. This creates a chemical reaction in their stomachs, which results in, well, Dracarys. While the Dragon Riders of Pern used their dragons to save their homeworld, the Valyrians used their dragons to oppress other nations. The Valyrians would conquer them and enslave them. Slavery drove the Valyrian economy. Hundreds of thousands toiled in the Valyrian mines. Many slaves would die there. Those that didn't would beg for death. Life was living torture. The Westerosi speak of seven hells. Perhaps the Valyrian mines were one of them. After we discover Aragon's tax policy, I want to know what Morgoth thought of the Freehold. It was with their dragons the Valyrians became a global superpower. Their first and only major rival being the old Gascari Empire. 
the Valyrian Freehold fought five great wars against the Giscari Empire. In the fifth and final war, the Valyrians employed scorched earth tactics. The Giscari cities were burned to the ground. Structures that were old when the Valyrian Empire was young were reduced to ash. The very earth the Giscari farmed was burned and then sown with salt, lime, and the bones of their dead so that nothing could grow there ever again. The Valyrians used their dragons not as nuclear deterrents but as nuclear weapons, raining hellfire down upon the Giscari for their resistance. The use of a nuclear bomb is devastating in the moment but the residual effects can linger on for years causing an area to become inhospitable. To this day, the Giscari lands have never recovered from the wrath of the Dragon Lords. The Royanar also dared to defy the Valyrians. When the Empire began to expand into their territory, the people of the Roin first welcomed them with open arms. But when the Empire sought to oppress and enslave them, the Royanar fought back. In the beginning, the Royanar, with their large armies and water wizards, were able to stand against the fires of the Freehold. A Royanish prince named Garen organized the largest army the Royanar had ever seen, a quarter million strong. After many successful battles, they began to call him Garen the Great. However, it was the Princess Nymeria, a brave warrior and valiant leader, who pointed out a cold truth. Battles could be won, but the Royanar could never hope to defeat the Valyrians in total war. Still, Prince Garen fought on. The Valyrians dispatched three riders and a Valentine army to deal with his defiance. Garen and his mighty host beat them back as he had in battles before. Two of the dragons were killed, one terribly wounded. In response to this defeat, the Valerians sent 300 dragon riders, 300 nuclear bombs. Quote, Against their fires, the Royanar could not stand. Tens of thousands burned, while others rushed into the river, hoping the embrace of Mother Roin would offer them protection against dragon flame only to drown in their mother's embrace. Some chroniclers insist the fires burned so hot the very waters of the river boiled and turned to steam. Garen the Great was captured alive and made to watch his people suffer for their defiance. His warriors were shown no mercy. End quote. Such was the might of the Valyrian Empire. There are hints throughout the books that the world in which this story takes place was much more magical in the past, but somehow, some way, the magic went away. Perhaps Valyria was one of the last bastions of magic in the world. That was until the doom. The Valyrians built their freehold on a chain of volcanoes called the Fourteen Flames. One day, for reasons unknown, the volcanoes erupted all at once. In half a heartbeat, the Valyrian Empire was no more. Ironic that the nation that destroyed so many others in fire could not save themselves from it. Now old Valyria is but a haunted desolation. Sailors are warned to never venture too close or else they might never return. Those who dare to even look upon that blighted land are believed to become cursed. In America, during the Cold War, when nuclear tensions were highest, the media released a steady stream of advice on what to do in the event of a nuclear attack. Americans were warned to not look directly into the blast. Doing so could cause severe burns to the retina or even blindness. Could it be that the doom was like a magical nuclear reactor exploding? In the African country of Gabon, there exists a natural nuclear reactor. It formed millions of years before humans could even conceive of technology, let alone nuclear power. One theory for the doom is that fire mages toiled beneath the 14 flames to keep the volcanoes from erupting. Fire mages were like scientists working at the heart of a nuclear reactor, 
maintaining the proper checks and balances to keep the site from experiencing a critical accident. But then something happened. Maybe the containment spells of the fire mages finally failed. Maybe the mages were all killed. Maybe there were no fire mages and the doom was just a natural accident. What truly happened within the 14 flames, no one may know. After the doom, magic contained on the Valyrian Peninsula would no longer be under control. It would be something like chaos magic now. Perhaps exposure to it would lead to unpredictable results, which explains the reports of monsters dwelling amongst the destruction. Perhaps old Valyria must be avoided until this chaos magic finally decays. King Jaehaerys the Conciliator made it forbidden for any Westerosi to visit Valyria, establishing something like the Old Valyria Exclusion Zone, just like the one that exists in Chernobyl today. Following the Doom, House Targaryen would eventually become the only dragon-riding family left in the world. Aegon, Visenya, and Rhaenys took the Seven Kingdoms by storm. Aegon desired that there be but one kingdom in all the land, and his sister wives assisted him in his ambitions. There were two major events during the conquest which involved the use of their dragons. The Field of Fire and Harrenhal. King Loren of House Lannister and King Myrn of House Gardiner took the field against Aegon and his sisters. With them came a host of 55,000 warriors. Aegon's forces were far fewer than that. When battle was joined, Aegon's army broke bad and deserted him. It seemed the Lion of the Rock and the Green Hand of Gardiner had crushed the conquest then and there. Facing defeat, Aegon chose the nuclear option. Never before in the war had he and his sisters flown their three dragons into battle at the same time. For each of the Targaryen monarchs and their dragons to fly into battle all at once was a huge risk. It is hard to kill a dragon, but not impossible. One must also take into account the damage that would be done. Aegon wanted to rule the Seven Kingdoms, not reduce them to ash. He could have used dragons in every battle, but he didn't. There are times when he sends forces to fight without the aid of Balerion, Maraxes, or Vagar. Use of dragons had to be carefully considered, the same way using nuclear weapons would be in war. The bomb Aegon and his sisters dropped on King Myrn and King Loren created a conflagration which would later be known as the Field of Fire. Thousands burned. King Myrn and all his sons among them, ending the line of House Gardiner. The survivors surrendered, including King Loren, a fact that leaves Tyrion Lannister feeling grateful when he remembers. Before that harrowing day, Aegon had the trouble of bringing House Hor into submission. King Harren Hor had spent years building his great folly, Harrenhal, the largest castle in all of Westeros. When his enslaved builders laid the final brick, Aegon Targaryen had made his landing. King Harren received word of Aegon's intentions by Raven, but rather than bend the knee, he sealed himself away in his castle along with all of his sons. When Aegon arrived on Balerion the Black Dread, Harren refused to swear fealty. He believed he was safe within the walls of his new castle. Quote, What is outside my walls is of no concern to me, said Harren. Those walls are strong and thick. I built in stone. Stone does not burn. To which Aegon said, When the sun sets, your line shall end. End quote. And then the sky fell upon Harrenhal. Harrenhal was made of more than just stone. There was wood as well, flammable goods in large storerooms. All of this burned when Aegon attacked on Balerion. The castle now, indeed, looks like it was hit by a bomb. The residual effects of Aegon's attacks still linger. 
Harrenhal sits feared, but not forgotten. This is when the Targaryen's dragons live up to the label of nuclear deterrent. When King Torrhen Stark marched from the north to meet the Targaryen host, his scouts brought him reports of the ruins of Harrenhal where slow fires still burned. He heard tale of the Field of Fire as well. Still, his bannermen encouraged him to attack. His bastard brother even believed he could kill the dragons with Werewood arrows. A foolish plan. Werewood would not be better at killing a dragon no more than any other wood, be it pine or redwood, sentinel or ironwood. If you can shoot through a dragon's eye and into its brain, the dragon will die. Accomplishing that, however, is the hard part. Torin had heard enough about dragons to make his decision. He would give up his crown on bended knee rather than watch the north burn. In this case, the dragons proved to be a successful nuclear deterrent. The Targaryens would not always have their dragons to enforce their will upon Westeros. Following the civil war known as the Dance of the Dragons, their dragons would soon die out. The House of the Dragon had lost its nuclear deterrent. Gone was their way of enforcing Targaryen exceptionalism. Now they were just like any other people. The Targaryens made many attempts at regaining their dragons, but those attempts would all end in failure or tragedy. Such is the case of Summerhall. King Aegon V had the issue of dealing with troublesome vassals during his reign. Aegon was much in favor of the small folk. The nobles were not. Aegon believed having dragons would bring more weight to his rule. He was desperate for his own nuclear deterrence. Now there is much to be said about Aegon wanting a nuclear option for him to have the chance to present his vassals with a choice. They can live in his new world or they can die in their old one. Can we trust that the king who was once a boy called Aeg would not in the end become corrupt with the equivalent of nuclear power at his disposal? Or would having that power reveal he was truly a good and just person? In the end, King Aegon did not get his dragons. Aegon wanted to use pyromancers to hatch his dragon's eggs, though he was warned by those closest to him not to go forward with his plan. Magic is unwieldy. Wildfire is volatile and unpredictable. King Aegon's attempt to gain a nuclear deterrent failed and many people died as a result. Flashes of emerald green may have been the last thing they witnessed in their final moments. In some nuclear accidents, the release of radiation is accompanied by the flash of a blue light. This is known as Cherenkov radiation, named after the scientists who discovered it in 1934. The color blue in A Song of Ice and Fire is often associated with death. Did Martin know about Cherenkov radiation before he began writing the series? Or is this nothing but an eerie coincidence? Harry Doglian saw a flash of blue light during his final fatal experiment with Rufus. I should mention now that Rufus wasn't a person. Rufus wasn't a lab animal. And no, Rufus wasn't a dragon. Rufus was the nickname given to a spherical mass of subcritical plutonium. 14 pounds heavy and around 3 inches in diameter. Harry Doglian would not be Rufus's only victim. After claiming the life of yet another scientist in yet another accident, Rufus would later become known as the Demon Corps. The experiments at the Los Alamos lab were in an effort to create nuclear weapons. When Harry Doglian misplaced that one carbide brick, he caused the Demon Corps to release a lethal dose of radiation. When I think about Martin's quote regarding the dragons being nuclear weapons, and I read about the experiments with the Demon Corps, I imagine the scientist at the Los Alamos lab as trying to hatch a dragon's egg. 
Aegon the Unlikely would not be the last Targaryen to try to bring back dragons into the world. In the year 299, his descendant Daenerys Targaryen would place three dragon eggs upon her dead husband's funeral pyre in an attempt to hatch them. Unlike Summerhall, her spell would be a success. She walked into the pyre and emerged unharmed, the unburnt, holding three living dragons. What pushed Daenerys into this dark and dangerous act was that she too was looking for her own nuclear deterrent. An assassination attempt ordered by King Robert Baratheon left Daenerys in fear of her own life as well as the life of her unborn son. With dragons, Danny could protect her son, she could protect her people, and she could one day take back the Iron Throne. It was a spell that she could never have hoped to work. Bodies burned in a great fire, the living and the dead. Only death can pay for life. Yet, she was reborn from the ash and smoke of the pyre and woke dragons from stone. Quote, Daenerys Stormborn, daughter of dragons, bride of dragons, mother of dragons. Don't you see? Don't you see? With a belch of flame and smoke that reached 30 feet into the sky, the fire collapsed and came down around her. Unafraid, Danny stepped forward into the firestorm, calling to her children. Now, she has become death, the stallion who mounts the world. Dragons are not like nuclear weapons in the most literal sense, but when you factor in their magical elements, their rarity, and the devastation they can cause when compared to other weapons of the time, you can see why the comparison might be made. What began as an interesting exercise, expanding on the idea of dragons being nuclear deterrents, turned into a terrifying reminder of just how powerful and dangerous dragons really are when used in war. And that's what they're primarily used for. War. Burning. Destroying. Killing. Forcing people into submission. In this series that leans towards realism, actions can have surprising consequences. Using a dragon in battle then, much like using a nuclear weapon, needs to be carefully considered. It is not as simple as mounting a dragon, saying Dracarys, and hoping that only the bad people die. Because when it comes to war, it is always the innocents that suffer the most when the High Lords choose to play their Game of Thrones. We knew the world would not be the same. Two people laughed. People cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death. 